blessed y'all are to have a choir like this uh, we've been in so many churches through the years that uh, they'd probably have the sin of envy uh, if they were to see your church and your choir so thank you so very much and I think they sing it like they mean it don't you amen that that's the main thing would you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 hopefully you have an outline there in your bulletin. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, you've been born again, as Jesus would say, you must be born again, then this morning's message ought to be, for a Baptist, ought to be shouting time. It ought to be some praise the Lord's and hallelujahs uh, as you think about what you have been given to you from God Almighty, because of your salvation. So this morning we want to look at the topic, Our Divine Inheritance is Guaranteed. Not everybody would agree with that, perhaps, but I think we're going to see this morning that the Bible certainly points in that direction. So in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 11, In Him, and Him is Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Father, thank You. Would You add a meaning, understanding, application to these words in Your Holy Scripture? And Lord, we want to again pray for Brother Cliff and Joyce. And would You just touch them today in a very special way. May they sense Your presence manifested to them in a very powerful way. We thank You now in Jesus' name. Amen. It was a cartoon showing a large group of people. Well, let me say it this way. Those people were actually a large group of greedy relatives. And they had all gathered there in the lawyer's office, waiting to hear the reading of the deceased will read. You get that picture? They're all gathered to hear the, a lawyer read the deceased person, their relative, to read his will. And here was the caption of that cartoon. I, John Jones, being of sound mind and body, spent it all. <laughs> when Jesus Christ when he wrote his last will and testament for the church, for his church, he made it possible for the true believer, the true followers, to share in his spiritual riches. Instead of spending it all, Jesus Christ paid it all. Think about that for a moment. His death on the cross and his resurrection made possible our salvation. He wrote us into his will. Then he died so his will would be in force. And then he arose again that he might become the heavenly advocate along with the Holy Spirit, the lawyer we might say, to make sure that the terms of his will were correctly followed. <laughs> wow, I'm glad he didn't spend it all, but he paid it all. So when I say that our divine inheritance is guaranteed, I'm talking about our salvation. That you're saved from the moment you truly trust the Lord Jesus Christ and He moves in through the person of the Holy Spirit. Not only do we get salvation as an inheritance, but we get all the blessings that go along with being a saved sinner. So, when it comes to our divine inheritance, it is guaranteed. We can be eternally grateful that, that, that God's promises are not like ours. No, every promise that God makes, He keeps. Why do I say that? Because our God is one who cannot lie. Think about that. Now our text this morning is verses 11 through 14, but I want us to kind of go up to a few verses beginning in verse 4 to just see some of the things that we have in our spiritual wealth by being a true believer in Christ. Look at verse 4. It says, just as He chose us in Him. So He has chosen us in Him. Verse 5. He has predestined us to adoption. See that? Verse 6. He has accepted us. Amen. Verse 7, the first part. He has redeemed us. The second part of verse 7. He has forgiven us. Verse 9. He has revealed God's will. What does it say? Say, having made known to us the mysteries of His will. Wow. You ever thought about some of that spiritual wealth? that you've received as a believer in Christ. But then we go to verse 11 again, and we're going to see in this message the source, the surety, and the significance of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 11 when it says, In Him, or uh, in Jesus we might say, yours may say, in whom, 
Also, we have obtained an inheritance. The source of our inheritance is Jesus Christ. That's the in Him, in whom. You know, apart from Jesus Christ, the only ultimate and eternal thing that, that, that a person can receive from God outside of Christ is God's condemnation. But in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who walk with the Lord. Now, it's true. It's true that God gives sunshine and, and rain and, and many other good things to everybody, both the righteous and the unrighteous. But the Bible indicates that His spiritual blessings are only given to those who are in Him. In Him, in Christ. Why do I say that? Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven, Jesus that is, that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So as a believer in Jesus, we have certain spiritual blessings. But it, when, it, when it says, we have obtained, it doesn't say we will obtain. It says we've already obtained. What does that mean? Well, in our vernacular, we'd say, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Yes, our inheritance has been obtained and it's guaranteed. In fact, Peter would agree with that back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what Peter says. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's Peter's idea of this inheritance that's guaranteed. Well, it's not just Peter's idea. It's God's idea through Peter. <laughs> And through Paul here in Ephesians, we have obtained a done deal, as I said. Do you know, I want you to think about it for a moment. If you're a believer, do you know that every conceivable need is met by God's gracious provisions in accordance with His divine promises? I want to just give you some. Think about them as I mention them. We are promised peace. Amen? Love, grace, wisdom, eternal life. Eternal life starts from the moment you're saved. It's not something you get later on. Amen? Amen. Joy, victory, strength, guidance, power, mercy, forgiveness, righteousness, truth, fellowship with God, spiritual discernment, heaven, eternal riches, and glory. You know, you got a whole wheelbarrow full of stuff as a believer in Christ. How can this be? Because we have been made joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He is therefore the source of our salvation, inheritance, because Paul is now going to show it to us in two perspectives. From God's perspective or divine perspective and from our human perspective. Think about this for a moment. Look at verse 11. After we've obtained. It says, being predestined according to the purpose of Him. Being predestined. A lot of misunderstanding about that. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it this morning. But I will say from eternity past, God has declared that every elect sinner, though we're vile, we're rebellious, we're useless, we deserve only death, but for those who will trust in His Son, they would be made as righteous as the one in whom they have put their trust. 
faith is only as good as the one in whom you place that faith. That's why so many people's faith fails because they didn't have faith in the one and only true and living God in Jesus Christ. Their faith failed because the one that they had the faith in failed. And Jesus never fails. Look at verse 4 again. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Why did He choose us? That we should be holy and without blame before Him. That was God's idea. But look what else it says here. Being predestined. And it says, Him who works. Works. That word works means energy. But by which we receive God's energies in us as His creation so that we might function. We see that in Paul's words in Philippians 1.5. 1, 1, uh, 1, Being confident of this very thing, that He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Wow. So God works out what He plans by His power. Think about that. But not only God's predestination and God's power through far works, but we see God's preeminence. When in the last part of verse 12, it says, to the praise of His glory. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment, but to the praise of His glory means that God has preeminence. He has first place. He's top shelf. None of us ever get there. We get close, and in Christ we actually will get there. But God has preeminence. Man is redeemed for the purpose of restoring the divine image that was marred when Adam and Eve sinned. I want you to think about something. Yes, we as humans are created in the image of God. True. But ever since sin entered into the world and Pandora's box of all kinds of things broke out, we have a marred image of God. Not the perfect image of God that they were born with, but a marred or a messed up image. And so for God to make our image not marred or messed up, He's got to do something for us. He's got to recreate us. He's got to redeem us and make us a new creation in Christ. Because our old self was marred. It's no longer the perfect image of God. We can thank Adam and Eve for that. Amen. So we are fallen humans. Would you agree with that? We're fallen humans. And because of that, we're the only ones that have an explanation for why everything goes on in this world the way it goes. Our son called us, and he's a bivocational pastor right now, and he, he teaches and coaches over at Slocum. That's up near Crockett, that area. Thursday night... They had a sophomore student killed in a car wreck. And that's a little, little school, probably maybe about the size of Burkeville, maybe. Small school, everybody knows everybody. Just devastating. But that's the world in which we live. Some people get to be old, some die young, some die in between those two perspectives. So what am I trying to say? Since we are fallen human beings and we live in a fallen world, then we are surrounded by distortion, by disease, by decay, by depravity, and by death. And any other D word you can come up with probably. Depravity, death, distortion, disease decay. So God, in His eternal plan, has chosen to reclaim us from that kind of condition. And therefore, when He reclaims us, then He can display us as His glory is through us. In other words, we become as a new believer in Christ, we become a trophy of grace because we're saved by grace through faith. Amen? A trophy of grace showing what our redeemed nature can become. You know, that's why Scripture always seems to present salvation from God's perspective. Think about that. Why? 
so that God can have full credit. It's his salvation that he gives to us through Christ. Our salvation then and all the blessings that go along with it of being saved are designed so that we should be to the praise of his glory, not for our own boasting. The old pastor said one time that he knew a young preacher that was still strutting when he sat down. Pretty high on himself. Said he walked up to the platform to preach and he couldn't get anything to come out. And the harder he tried, the worse he got. Finally, he had to get on his hands and knees and crawl off the platform. And the pastor said, if he had come, out, come up like he left, he'd been able to leave like he came up. <laughs> God is the only one who should have the glory. We boast about him. That's the divine perspective from God's salvation inheritance. But yes, we have a part. Verse 12 and 13 also tell us about the human perspective of our salvation. Look what it says. In verse 12, it says that we who first trusted. You see that word trusted? Now, look at verse 13. In Him you also did what? Trusted? <laughs> After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed... Here's the human perspective of salvation. Trusted, trusted, believed. Now I want you to think about that for just a moment. In our little finite minds, it is very, very, very difficult to harmonize God's sovereignty and man's free will. A lot of people go one way or the other, and they almost become heretical the way they go one way or the other. Because you know why? Because both of those are true. God's sovereignty is true. Man's free will is true. But how do they harmonize? In our little finite minds, we really can't understand it that well. I think it's going to be like a V8 commercial when we get to heaven. You get to heaven you say... I'm trying to harmonize your sovereignty, God, and my free will, and here I am. So that's how it works. <laughs> that's how it works. God knows how they harmonize even though we don't. Someone has pictured both the divine and the human side of our salvation this way. When you look toward heaven, you see a sign that says, Whosoever will may come. You turn around, look at the other side of the sign, and it says, chosen from the foundation of the world. Two sides of the same sign or coin. Both are true. Can we fully understand them? No, but we believe them because the Bible says God is sovereign, and yes, we have to choose Him who has chosen us. Wow. Yes, faith that God gives us is our response to God's elective purpose. God's choice of believers is, is, is election, but our choice of God is by faith. If in election God gives His promises, and by faith we receive those promises. So Jesus is the source of our inheritance. Why do I say that? Because Jesus was fully human and fully God, and He understands sovereignty and free will. He always chose what the Father wanted Him to do, though, didn't He? Amen. That's the source. But now the surety of our inheritance, beginning there in verse 13b, or the middle part of verse 13, it says, in Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We're going to see a couple of things here. We're going to see God's sealing, 
And we're also going to see the pledge or the guarantee that God gives us all of this to help us understand what He has done for our salvation. Mankind has always wanted assurances, right? Why? Because the promises of other men are so often unreliable. <laughs> we have to demand a, an oath or a sworn affidavit or a surety bond or a guarantee or a warranty and many other such means trying to assure that what's been promised to us is going to take place. The extended car warranty. I'm sure you've gotten a phone call about those, haven't you? <laughs> now God's Word ought to be sufficient in and of itself, but in His graciousness He makes these promises even more certain by giving us His own guarantee through the words seal or guarantee or pledge. So in verse 13 we saw where it says we were what? Sealed by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? One, one means of God uh, promising or guaranteeing our promises is that we have received Jesus Christ and therefore God has sealed us with His Holy Spirit a promise. Every believer is given the Holy Spirit at the moment they truly believe because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you've not been saved yet. I need to give you that scripture and it just ran by me. Yes, when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit, the, the person and power of Jesus in our lives, the Holy Spirit is our helper, makes intercession for us, is our guarantee. Wow. Protects us, encourages us, and guarantees our inheritance. Now the sealing that Paul is talking about here speaks, it, it refers to an official mark of identification that would be placed on a letter or a contract or some other important document. Kind of like the, 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 the seals in the book of Revelation. Remember reading about those. They were sealed. And only one was found that could unseal them. And that was Jesus, the Lamb. But the seal in that day was made with wax, hot wax. And the document would be folded up or rolled up and the seal would be placed on where they overlapped. And then a ring, a signet ring of some sort, would be placed into that wax signifying who had the authority to seal that document. Also, who would have the authority to unseal that document. So a signet ring, we might say. Well... That's, that document, in this case, our salvation inheritance, is officially identified with and under the authority of the person in whom the signet belonged. And who would that be? Jesus Christ. Or maybe the entire Godhead, the Trinity. But that idea of being sealed with the Holy Spirit seems to show us several things. When you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that talks about your security. The Holy Spirit secures us eternally as a child of God. It also talks about, listen to this, our authentic, authenticity. When God gives us the Holy Spirit, it's as if He stamps us with a seal that reads... This person belongs to me and is an authentic citizen of my divine kingdom and a member of my divine family. Did you know that's what happened to you when you got saved? It did. You're authentic, not counterfeit. Authentic. But it also shows us about ownership. When the Holy Spirit seals believers, He marks them as God's own divine possession for eternity. The Spirit's seal declares the transaction of salvation as divinely official and final. Can I ask a question? Who could remove this seal to take away ownership? 
only the one who gave it, and he says he's not going to because it was real. Finally, it also gives us authority when we've been placed under the seal of ownership. We've got delegated authority to minister in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. For the believer to minister, to teach, to, to, to even defend God's Word and His Gospel, not with our authority, but with that same authority Jesus told His disciples about, about going therefore and make disciples of all nations. And all authority has been given unto you that was given to Him. So that's the seal. But now notice what it says there in verse 14, the first part. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The guarantee. Now this is the, the, the pledge or guarantee, whatever your translation says. The King James calls it the earnest of our inheritance. The New King James and the English Standard Version call it the guarantee of our inheritance. The NIV calls it the pledge of our inheritance. So you get those kind of words translated from this original word. But the word that's translated here originally referred to a, a, a down payment or an earnest money contract given to secure a purchase. I don't know if those terms are used much anymore, but for us that are, have a few years on us, we remember that, right? I don't know what they call them nowadays. But it was an earnest money contract saying... I want to buy it, and here's my earnest money, so I'm going to buy it. Well, this is interesting, though. That word for pledge or guarantee also came to be known as an engagement ring. You say, what? <laughs> Hang with me. Paul seems to be saying here that as believers... We have the Holy Spirit as our divine pledge or guarantee that guarantees the fullness of those promises that God has given us. Think about this. They're going to be completely fulfilled, especially our salvation complete. So the engagement ring would assure and guarantee with an absolute certainty that only God could provoke or provide only he could provide so what am I saying the Holy Spirit then became the church's irrevocable pledge her engagement ring so to speak as the bride of Christ so the bride of Christ has received an engagement ring in the person of the Holy Spirit what does that mean the bride of Christ, the true bride of Christ, will never be neglected, will never be forsaken, and will never be left at the altar. What a beautiful picture of that, of, of that pledge or, or guarantee. So God guarantees our salvation with a seal and with a pledge. And that's why we can say our guarantee of salvation is a sure thing. That's the surety of it. And finally, we see in verse 14, the second part, it says, until the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Here is the third point. The significance of our inheritance. Even though our inheritance is awesome, it's wonderful, I don't think it's the primary purpose of our salvation. Those are good things. But our salvation and all the promises and the blessings and the privileges that we gain through our salvation have been given to us with the view of redemption from God as His own possession to the praise of His glory. In other words, He glorifies Himself by saving us. <laughs> wow. Now I want you to see something. I want you to notice how three times Paul uses, we have to go back up to verse 6 to get the, 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 the first point, but all three of these have the words to the praise of His glory or some, uh, something similar to that. Look at verse 6. 
to the praise of the glory of His grace. To the praise of the glory of His grace. That part of Scripture starts out with, Blessed be the God and Father. That's talking about to the praise of His glory, the God the Father. Look at verse 12. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. To the praise of His glory is talking about the second person of the Trinity, Christ, the Son. And then in verses 13 through 14, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 14. To the praise of His glory. Now I want you to see something. The entire Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are included in to the praise of His glory. One God, three persons. That sounds pretty important, doesn't it? To the praise of the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's kind of deep thinking about, isn't it? But it's true. You see, other places in the Bible talk about this, but... What does this mean to the praise of His glory? What in the world does that mean? Would you agree with me that true glory is found only in the splendor of Almighty God? You know how He revealed Himself to the children of Israel? True splendor, the glory of God. So how do we show to the praise of His glory? Well, His glory would be recognized as His character displayed in His actions through us and reflected back to Him for praise. Did you get that? His character through His actions through us and we praise Him For that. Wow. Isn't that what Ephesians says in 2.10? What does it say? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Walk in them. Not work in them, but walk in them. Already prepared. And then Matthew 5.16, what does it say? You are the light of the world. And let your... Works be seen by man so it glorifies the Father in heaven. All of that's tied together. So we're not saved and blessed for our own glory, but for God's. We glorify ourselves. What does that do? It robs God of who He really is. He saved us to serve Him and to praise Him. We are saved to be restored to the original intended purpose of creation so that we might bear the image of God until we go home to be with Him. I close with an illustration from Dr. John MacArthur. He tells a story of an encounter that he had one summer when he was the camp pastor at a camp. He noticed a young man who had a severely withered arm and leg. And he saw that young man would always kind of stay at the back of the group, would kind of stand in the corner, kind of away from everybody. Didn't participate with the other campers. So John MacArthur on the second day went over to him and introduced himself. And asked the young man his name. Here was the response. He pulled up his sleeve that uncovered his deformed arm and he said this. Look what God did to me. Now I'm sure John MacArthur was a lot younger then. But he still had to say God help. (laughs) How do I answer this? He said... After praying silently for God's wisdom, John said, would you like to know something? That's not you. What do you mean it's not me? No. John MacArthur said, no, it's just the house that you're living in. And that house is very temporary. But you are a forever person. What happened? That young man began to think, maybe God has a plan for my life. That he would receive that new heavenly body someday. After that young man said, you're kidding. Then John said, no, I'm not kidding. (laughs) 
And he shared the gospel with that young man. The young man gave his heart and his life to Jesus Christ and his attitude and his outlook immediately changed. One of the first things he did was to ask Dr. John MacArthur to play a game of ping pong with him. I'd like to do that. You see, that young man no longer seemed to be embarrassed or even bitter about the physical handicaps that he had. Why? Because as soon as Jesus Christ came in and began to take control of his life, he realized that God had some things in him for his life that surpassed what in his human perspective seemed to be so terribly important weren't. When he knew he was part of God's eternal plan and had received God's eternal promises, his perspective dramatically changed. His physical condition did not change whatsoever, but his spiritual condition did. And I believe we would be able to hear that young man say, to the praise of his glory. What about us this morning? Whether young or not so young or somewhere in between. Maybe some afflictions. But I have to say this, as long as you and I are still here and we have breath, we have a purpose. And that purpose is however we find ourselves to ask God to continue to use us, not for ourselves, but to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father, may that be our prayer this morning. God, continue to use us as your children, those that you have redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Help us, Lord, to continue to serve you to the praise of your glory is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our hymn of response this morning? And if God has tapped you on the shoulder and wants you to make a public decision of some sort, we invite you to come. I'll meet you here at the front. Number 275, I Surrender All. <clears throat> To Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His breast daily live. I surrender all. I surrender. Something to think about, isn't it? Amen. Some heavy stuff at times this morning. Something to go back and review and ask the Lord to give you better understanding. Hopefully I didn't cloud up the issues, but he can clear them up for you. I was told that that clock is wrong. Is it not is right. Not, it is not. It is slow. Yes. It's 11.03. <laughs> Maybe somebody can figure out how to move it back. Uh, it so is when I possessed. look at it, I won't have to interpolate six minutes slow or whatever. It is possessed, Jerry. It, it's possessed. Every one of them. We have a, we have a clock at home that uh, it rings on the hour, but not until five minutes after the hour. <laughs> so, I don't know. I almost made it. Sorry that I well, didn't fine. again, but... If somebody can, if you do change it, let me know, though. <laughs> it gets right. worse, Jerry. It uh, gets worse. <laughs> uh, Brother Ed Eccles would lead us in our closing prayer. Before you do that, are there any announcements, anything that you just got to say? No? God bless you. Have a great week, Brother Ed. Amen. <coughs>